So welcome back, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Uh, just before we move into this session, just four, uh, four, five new short housekeeping um, notes. The cake hasn't disappeared. I'm now told it will be out at lunchtime. Um, we have a hashtag for tweeters. And there are two, uh, actually, I gather that my colleagues in the UKCC are offering two tweeting prizes. One for the tweet that has been retweeted the most. Now, I'm not quite sure I understand what that means, but apparently <laughs> it can be. And the second prize is for? Uh, the tweet yes, the, the tweet that the highly sophisticated and balanced uh, judging group thinks is the most engaging uh, tweet. So, so get, get tweeting. Secondly, several people have already begun to ask about whether the talks from yesterday and today will be available. You should find yesterday's talks are already uploaded to the Cochrane Collaboration YouTube channel. With the help of Chris Mavergames, we, we got that process started this morning. So we believe that they should be there. Someone can perhaps check. But the talks from yesterday will, are there, and the talks from today will be there. Um, please don't forget to sign up. At this session, when we all begin in here after lunch, we will announce which rooms the different engagement activities are in. We still have far fewer people signed onto the sheets than we know there are people here. So we already have a flavor of the size of the groups, but if you could just indicate which group you might go to, that would be helpful. And, and one, one last thing. Um, there's a bookstall now outside. They have copies of Steve, Lisa, and Gilbert Welch's book on overdiagnosis. They've got copies of Ben Gildaker's book, Bad Pharma. There's also available outside what I would call proper copies of One, Man Med One Man's Medicine, Archie's Cochrane's autobiography. I say proper because it's real paper and it's nice to hold and feel. But um, Muir and, and Ben have been working on a project to get it put online. And you should have in your pack, and there's some more of these slips available, a web link to the place where you can look at one of the chapters now, but you will ultimately be able to get a Kindle version of that book. So now, moving on to our next challenge, the challenge posed in this internet media savvy world of communication. And I'm delighted to introduce our speakers. We, I'm going to introduce them one at a time because they're going to speak separately and then have questions after each talk on, on this occasion. And it, I, for many of you, I don't think you, Andre will, Tomlin will need much introduction because he's familiar to many of you as someone who works in Oxford for Minovation, the organization that produces a variety of different uh, web media. Something he set up with his business partner, Douglas Badnock in 2002. And he also runs something called the National Elf Service, which isn't just the way they talk about the NHS in South London, but actually is a real thing, which I'm, maybe he'll, he'll tell us about. But Andre, we're very grateful for you coming and sharing your knowledge about you know, how this stuff is done and how it all works with us. And thanks very much. Thanks, Martin. Hi, everyone. Um, wow, 21 years. Uh, I started working in Oxford in uh, 1994 uh, with Muir Gray, uh, and I've worked here ever since. I've spent my whole career here uh, working in evidence-based healthcare, um, and so it's a real pleasure to be invited to talk about Engaging evidence. Um, blogging and social media is what I'm going to talk about. I've said that to a few people over the last few hours, and there's been lots of terrified looks. Please don't worry if that's um, something you're not too familiar with. I'm going to keep it really simple. This is going to be a practical talk about how to use blogging and social media to disseminate review findings and to engage with people, both professionals and patients, about your work. Um, I'm going to speak for about 15 minutes, and I'm going to have some questions, and then Tracy is going to talk um, afterwards. So this is the obligatory slide about me. This will be really quick. Um, I'm a healthcare information scientist. Uh, I've worked in Oxford, uh, as I say, for the last 15 years or so, uh, for the NHS, uh, for Oxford University for a few years, and then for the last decade or so as um, a commercial organisation called Minovation. 
uh, and we are an evidence-based healthcare consultancy, which is basically just a grand way of saying we build health websites. Um, I should say the LifeScan website that we're involved in is not the LifeScan website that you were being told about by Steve earlier. That's a very different thing. Um, that's a project we work on with Johnson & Johnson about diabetes uh, monitors. So, our ethos of innovation is that healthcare websites should be these three things. This sounds really obvious. They should be accessible and usable and reliable. And obviously, when we're talking about accessibility, that means being able to get into the website. Uh, and that's often about disabilities, so making sure your website works for everybody with disabilities, whether they're blind or physically disabled. Making sure your videos have subtitles or a transcript. Um, usability, obviously, is about whether, once they've found the website, can they get the information they need? Can they answer their questions? So is it clear? Is it concise? Is it engaging? Does it have the right sort of functionality required to actually find an answer to their specific question? And we all know about reliability, hopefully, in this room. Um, the information has to be based on the best available evidence, clearly. It has to be kept up to date, written by people who know what they're talking about. We've used these criteria over the last sort of 10 years or so to measure lots of different websites. And whenever we do it, this is how Cochrane always comes out. Cochrane Library, Cochrane Review Group websites, Cochrane websites generally, I think, are very reliable, as you would hope. But in my experience, and the experience of health professionals that I've shown them to, and patients that I've shown them to, they always come out as being quite inaccessible and completely unusable. Um, and so that's really, I think, one of the first challenges that you need to ensure you're not just producing really good quality content, but you're also making sure that people can actually find it and use it. Okay, there's two quick slides with elves in them, so please um, prepare yourself for lots of smiley little people. Um, I've been a really keen blogger for a really long time, uh, also a keen user of social media for many years. And this is my blog, uh, it's called The Mental Elf, and it's aimed at health and social care professionals. Not aimed at patients, despite the way it looks, it's aimed at professionals. And our a kind of ethos, I guess, is that we think health professionals also like accessible and usable. It's not just the reliable stuff they like. They also like a fun, engaging experience. They like to be motivated to read about evidence-based information. And that's what we're trying to do with these blogs. Uh, so what I do is I find good quality material. That might be nice guidance. It might be Cochrane reviews. It might be an RCT in the BMJ. Um, I praise it and I summarize it on my blog. So every day, Monday to Friday, there's one thing that I highlight I write a blog about it, and I allow people to link through uh, to the full text. And people seem to like that approach. They seem to like the coverage. Uh, they seem to like the format that we blog in. Uh, you can read it in two or three minutes. Um, and virtually everyone that I've shown it to seems to like the design and the idea of the elves as well. So we've expanded that idea across a number of different health topics. Uh, we've got eight elves, one's missing from here at the moment. Um, so from everything from dentistry to diabetes or from education to learning disabilities, there's an elf that can help you keep in touch with the latest research. Uh, and I'm not the only elf in the room. Uh, we've got Tracy Howe over here somewhere. Where's Tracy? There's Tracy. Uh, Tracy is the musculoskeletal elf, middle of the top row there. Uh, and Sarah Chapman from the UKCC uh, is also here. She works on the lifestyle elf, the very, very cool athletic one in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, and so, yeah, that, there's the elves. I'm going to come back and talk about them a bit later on. But for now, I'm going to talk about how professionals keep up to date with the evidence. So traditionally, I think the way this works is that we talk to each other. Um, over coffee, clinical meetings, journal clubs. That's the way most people say they keep up to date. We go to conferences, we go to meetings, that's obviously still very important. And we have some of us access to libraries, journal subscriptions that help us keep up to date with the latest stuff. And obviously for the last 20 years or so, we've had access to the internet, to various websites and online databases, to CPD systems, 
Um, and often what you hear from health professionals, when you ask them about that experience of those sorts of things, this is the kind of answer that you get, particularly for CPD systems, in my experience. So there's a number of drawbacks to those traditional ways of keeping up to date. Um, probably the biggest drawback is that they're so slow to actually get evidence into practice, getting it to the coalface. And also there's so much noise, uh, there's so much irrelevant material, it takes a really long time to actually find the thing you're interested in. And when you do, it's often presented in a way which lacks any kind of critical appraisal. So it's really difficult to quickly and finally uh, quickly find it and use it. So increasingly, people are starting to use newer technologies to help them to keep up to date. That means smartphones. I think most of us have got one of these permanently attached to our hands these days. Uh, that means social networking, social media, increasingly Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, and it also means better connectivity on more usable devices, which means you can actually use it in your clinical practice. You can actually dip into something and find it quickly. People are starting to do that. So these newer technologies that people are starting to use, I guess what they're doing is they're giving us access to more personalised, more relevant feeds that you can subscribe to. So you can follow people and you can get stuff pushed at you. So it's not a question of thinking, oh, I've got a question here, let's see if I can answer it, go and search Medline. You can actually have things alerted and sent to you and popping up on your mobile phone on various topics if you're following the right people, if you're a member of the right networks. And it also gives you access to a huge international network of people with your interests. If you work in quite a, a small field, a rare disorder, it makes the world a lot smaller. So I think in the last 20 years or so, since Cochrane began, the way that we communicate with technology uh, has just completely changed, beyond all recognition. And I'm just going to give a couple of examples of, of how that works. And the first one isn't a health example. Um, hands up, who's heard of the Harlem Shake? Wow, most of you, or maybe ha over half of you, okay. <laughs> so hands up, who's seen the Harlem Shake? <coughs> okay, okay, that's good. Um, most of us have probably heard it on the news, on Newsnight. I saw it was on the BBC News yesterday, I think, because a librarian got sacked from St Hilda's College for organising a Harlem Shake in the college library. At 12 o'clock one Sunday night, they spent six minutes dancing around. They filmed it, they stuck it on YouTube, and there's terrible things going on um, as a result. This is a really good example of something spreading virally and very, very quickly on the internet. It's an internet meme. Uh, meme is a word that Richard Dawkins first defined uh, many, many years ago, mid-70s, when he published his book, The Selfish Gene, uh, derives from the Latin word mimema, which means the imitated thing. Um, and an internet meme is something that gets spread very quickly from person to person, in this case, via YouTube. So we had some Australians, I think, originally, who would think it, uh, who dressed up in funny suits and danced around for 30 seconds. Um, and the way the Harlem Shake works is that one person dances around on their own um, and then after 15 seconds or so, the music drops and suddenly everyone goes mad and it's mayhem. Uh, it's, and it's wonderful and it's beautiful, apparently. Um, and so fairly quickly, within a couple of days of those Australians uploading their video, um, some other people were doing the same sort of thing in their costumes with the same music. And then a couple of days later, suddenly big crowds of people were doing this on the subway, they were doing it in the park with Granny. <laughs> uh, the Royal Ballet got in on the act doing the Harlem Shake. That's the best one. If you, if you haven't seen the Harlem Shake, check out the Royal Ballet one. That one's brilliant. Uh, they were doing it in the Middle East. Underwater. Such attention to detail. And even The Simpsons last week had this as an introduction on one of their shows. Uh, just within a few weeks of this viral video going live on the internet. So... Yeah, I mean, incredible. Um, I think a week after the original video was uploaded, 4,000 Harlem Shake videos were being uploaded to YouTube every day. So we can apply that same kind of model to healthcare. Um, and this is a really good example, I think, that's happened again fairly recently. Um, a blog written by David Cahoon, um, professor, pharmacologist, and um, science blogger of the year last year, 
um, somebody who loves blogging and social media, identified a serious problem with the NHS Choices website. Uh, he um, conducted a freedom of information request and he found information that showed that the Department of Health had been lobbied by Prince Charles's integrated, um, for, sorry, Foundation for Integrated Health, uh, now known as the College of Medicine, which had caused the NHS Choices page on homeopathy to be removed and replaced with this page whilst it was being updated. Um, this page is very, very brief. Uh, it says very little about homeopathy. Uh, it links to a couple of DH and House of Commons reports. It also links to an excellent leaflet produced by Sense About Science on homeopathy. But interestingly, on the right-hand side, it links to many, many pro-homeopathy organisations as well. And this is what the web page looked like for many, many months. Uh, Cahoon blogged about this, and he said the Department of Health has not just ignored evidence, but actively opposed it. And David Mattin, who is the editor of that page on NHS Choices, said, one thing is clear, the DH is an unholy mess. Parts of it are intent on producing policy-based evidence. This story appeared in The Guardian the same day as David Cahoon's blog. It was covered in the paper edition, got a full page spread in the paper. And a couple of days later, the Daily Mail picked it up and covered the story. Also appeared in the BMJ that week, center stage on their web page. And less than a week after the Cahoon blog was published, the NHS Choices page was changed and replaced with a much improved page at which point he said on his blog, this looks like bloggers one, DH nil. A couple of days later, it was replaced slightly by a not quite so good version, a few things removed from it. And interestingly, the comments that were posted by Cahoon and colleagues on the NHS Choices website were moderated and not included. But this is what the NHS Choices homeopathy page looks like now today, and it's a very good page on the whole. Uh, containing a very sound, evidence-based message um, highlighting the lack of science be behind homeopathy. Now, I imagine what you're thinking is, um, okay, well, nice example, but I'm no David Cahoon or I'm no Ben Goldacre. You know, I just want to take the results of my Cochrane reviews and try and get them out there and get people to read them and to discuss them. Is that what you're thinking? Or? Hmm. So I'm going to give you an example. This is really practical, something that I hope you can take away, uh, which is something that I've done recently, to blog about an issue and to get lots of people, thousands of people, to read it and to engage with it. So this is a blog I wrote on the mental health back in June last year. You may have seen this study, it's quite um, well covered in the news at the time, published in June in the BMJ, it's an RCT um, that looked at measuring the effectiveness of a specific exercise therapy for adults with depression who presented in primary care. And it was a well conducted piece of research, disappointing uh, conclusion, the trial found that adding facilitated physical activity to usual care didn't improve depression, it didn't reduce antidepressant use when compared with usual care alone. But the study didn't look at prevention of depression, and it only looked at this one specific exercise intervention. So imagine my surprise the next day when I looked at the newspaper headlines of that study to see that they said, exercise, no help for depression. Exercise does little to help the symptoms of depression. Exercise doesn't help depression. Uh, and the sun went with stunning Abby Crouch, his most definitely something special. <laughs> so, um, not everyone covered it, but those that did presented it with very misrepresentative headlines. Uh, they implied that exercise was of no use for depression, um, which was not what this trial concluded, and not what lots of other trials have concluded, not what a lot of patients tell us. Um, so why, why are these headlines appearing like this? Um, obviously, it's not a terribly interesting story when you read the actual, um, normally quite well-written journalism behind the headlines. Um, maybe they just wanted to get some more readers, get people clicking on the headlines. 
Maybe also they were affected by the rather over-egged press release that came out of the university that was involved with the research that actually said pretty much that exercise didn't help with depression. So a lot of journalists were reading that and, and more or less repeating it. So as you can imagine, that made the mental health very angry indeed. Um, and so I wrote this blog, um, which went out that same day, saying exercise doesn't help with depression, have the headline writers got it wrong again. It took me about 45 minutes to write that blog. It's about 300 words long. It's a very succinct, simple summary of the research. Short, easy to read, focused on the conclusions of the trial, highlighting why the headline writers got it wrong. Um, I presented you know, the trial results, also the methods, and also included some pictures and some videos and made it kind of a fun you know, three minutes in your day, whether you're reading it on your phone or you're just um, having a look at coffee time. I then sent that across social media. So I tweeted it. I sent it to Facebook. I sent it to LinkedIn. And that was what the tweet looked like. And it linked back to my blog. So a few hundred people saw that straight away. I got lots of people replying, lots of people retweeting it, sending it to their followers. Um, lots of immediate discussion straight away. Yeah, this is an interesting story. Why have they got it wrong? What's going on here? And then I started sending it to other people on Twitter. So I specifically targeted people that I thought might be interested in. And just about everyone's on Twitter these days. So I sent it to the researcher. I sent it to lots of mental health experts, to mental health charities, to the publisher of the research, to the journalists that had written the stories with the terrible headlines. And I said, what do you think of this? Uh, and most of them replied, um, and we got into some really interesting discussions. Um, and within three hours, the BBC had changed the headline on their website to something much more representative of what the actual research said, which was pleasing. A couple of days later, I wrote a follow-up blog which said, here's the evidence for exercise if you're depressed. <laughs> which is certainly not conclusive evidence. You know, this is an emerging field, but there is interesting research in this area. There's a nice guideline. There's a few systematic reviews. There's a couple of Cochrane reviews. Um, there's some RCTs. There's some very good quality patient information which has been produced in a very evidence-based way. And it's worth saying that those two blogs that I wrote um, were the most popular blogs I wrote last year, those two exercise and depression blogs. And that's partly, I think, because it's an interesting topic, because people are quite interested in a topic that's much broader than depression. But also, I think, because of the, the, the social media activity that I, I spent that day doing. I sent it to lots of people, I engaged with lots of people, and so thousands of people came to the website as a result and read my blog. And a significant number of them clicked through and read the BMJ RCT. And that was my key objective here, trying to get health professionals, busy health professionals, busy social care professionals, engaged with the evidence, reading the actual evidence. So, very simple process, I think, of just communicating in an easy, engaging format a piece of research, combining a, an evidence-based process for producing information with an informal and accessible style for presenting it. Um, I challenged the misreporting of the story, um, and I had lots of conversations with people on Twitter that day and over the following weeks, which were always informed by the evidence. So whenever somebody said to me, so what do you think of this? I brought it back to my blog. I brought it back to the research. So... I've been thinking about how we can apply that to Cochrane. You can all become elves. You can all start writing blogs and spending your days on Twitter. Um, some, of, some, some people are doing that, uh, maybe not spending their days on Twitter. Um, but how can you be more um, accessible, more usable, more engaging like the lifestyle elf? Some of that's around language and format, I think. And I think that's something that Cochrane has known about for many, many years. Cochrane reviews are very difficult to read and to understand, if you're a busy health professional particularly. And you're obviously working on that. There's lots of projects around producing summaries, producing alternative ways of presenting the review findings, and that's great. 
What I would say is that actually the, the Cochrane summaries that we've shown to people and asked about accessibility and usability are sometimes very hard as well. Um, and that's not because they're not written clearly always, it's because they aren't that fun to read um, and they don't really motivate people to read them. And that's as much about the way they're presented in terms of design as it is about the actual content itself. I think there's an issue of branding. Cochrane has a really, really strong brand and lots of followers on social media as a result. But I wonder how well that brand works with the general public. Um, and I wonder how well it works with younger professionals. Um, it's strong and it's reliable, but I don't know how approachable it is or how, how easy people find it to engage with that brand. So how many people send you questions on Twitter, for example, at the Cochrane Collaboration or at any of the Cochrane accounts? <coughs> I think there's also something really key about how you engage with your audience. And what a lot of organizations do when they first go on social media is they use it as a publishing platform. And they say, look at us, look at what we're doing. We've published this, this is interesting, look at our work. And it's kind of like the boring person at a dinner party who talks about themselves. Um, and you get lots of followers, but you don't get much engagement because you're just saying, look at me. You're not asking questions, you're not really engaging with existing conversations that are going on. I think that's definitely a challenge for all of us using social media, but particularly for big organisations like yourselves. How to find the existing conversations, how to engage with people on those sorts of platforms. Social media, particularly Twitter, is very conversational. So you just have to start joining in with conversations and you'll get it. I think you also need to act very responsively, act quickly. Um, the exercise and depression story is a really good example of that. The next week, we weren't talking about exercise and depression anymore. We were talking about something else on Twitter. So if something comes out, you really do have to respond quickly to it. And obviously, there's a capacity issue there for all of you and all of your organisations. But don't just work around your own publishing timetable. Work around what's going on, what's hot on Twitter and in the press. Okay, thanks very much. That's me done uh, for my talk. Um, these are my contact details. If you want to get in touch, please do. If you're not keen to ask a question now, please come and grab me afterwards or drop me an email. I would be delighted to talk to about social media or Twitter. Um, and if any of you want to get involved in what we're doing with the National Health Service, um, talk to Tracy, talk to Sarah, or come and have a chat with me. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Time for some uh, questions. Any questions for uh, for Andre? We've got a, ro a roving microphone. Yes, the first one here. Um, thank you, Andre. It was a very interesting presentation. Um, I had a question. I'm wondering. One of the things we have always also in doing Cochrane reviews is there is more RCTs or research done in drug intervention rather than non-drug intervention. So consequently, the evidence is stronger. Everything comes stronger. How you, and when you make it accessible to people, it might give a biased view that people can use drugs more than non-drugs. How you ensure that there is a balanced view when the users are, that they understand that the reason that there is more stronger support for that is not that because they're necessarily better, it's just because research is more done in that area. I would just do what you just did, I think. I would explain it really clearly and really accessibly. Um, for that audience. And that's the great thing about blogging is you can just write it as a conversation. You know, you can say it as you would say it to somebody face to face. So I would say, here's the results of the Cochrane review. This is how they conducted the review. These are the results they found. These are the conclusions. Um, isn't that interesting? Isn't that useful? But here's the bigger picture. There are other interventions that you might want to consider. Um, you refer to other um, publications. And that's the great thing about the blogging format and the social media format is that it is informal and conversational, so it's really easy to make the point in the way that you just did. Thank you. Next question out there, and then we'll come down here. But Hi, you first. Um, I'm Tess Moore from the Cochrane Heart Group. Um, when it was set up, I worked on the NHS Choices website. Um, and what, one thing they did at the start, which I don't think they're doing now so much, was they used tabloid writers and part of the website was a magazine section. Um, and the tabloid writers had previously been working for an organization where they produced 
magazines that looked like take a break, um, but they contained uh, evidence-based healthcare advice, and these were put into doctors' surgeries. Doctors' surgeries could subscribe to have these mags that had a reading age of eight or nine and, and had articles like um, uh, Wayne Rooney explaining how he examined his testicles for cancer and that kind of thing. Lots of photos and stuff like that. Do you, and, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Didn't mean that. <laughs> Obviously that would put people off. But, um, <laughs> do, you, do you think Cochrane and healthcare websites could, um, could use people who write um, for people like my mum, for example? Is that a good way forward for us? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think certainly good journalism, uh, you know, works. Uh, as we've seen with some of the examples before coffee, you know, some of that is great journalism, but it's just giving you the wrong message that we wouldn't want to be giving people. If you combine great journalism and a very accessible way of presenting it, whether that's TV or radio or magazines in the doctor's surgery, with what you've got, which is incredibly good quality, reliable content, you're onto a winner. It seems really obvious. Um, you've focused a lot more, I think, in the last 10 years particularly on the content being really good quality and reliable and the process of how to make it reliable and the process of how to keep it up to date and really forgotten about the dissemination part of that and actually showing it to people part and engaging with people about it, which is absolutely essential. If you don't do that, then there's no point doing the first part. We'll have one last question before someone tweets that Cochrane UK is talking about photographing Wayne Rooney's testicles. So, so <laughs> Bernie. Thank yeah. Andre, thank you. So, um, w one issue, though, is that for a lot of, of healthcare organisations, um, devices and computers, etc., don't allow access to Twitter or uh, Facebook or any of that. So, so, are there any studies showing that these things actually have helped full outcomes for practice that could be part of trying to get such organisations to see them as helpful tools? Oh, good question. Uh, not my specialist area, I must admit. Um, I'm sure studies are ongoing. I've certainly been well aware of the problems with accessing WordPress, actually, which is the system I use to blog, gets blocked by some NHS networks. So trust staff can't read any blogs at all. Um, you know, Twitter and Facebook get blocked. I think increasingly that's changing. The last year or so, I've heard a lot of people saying we're opening up a bit more to that. So I think the value of those platforms is being recognised a bit more by the kind of Nazi IT departments that you often have. But I think actually mobiles, in some ways, kind of bypass that because generally with, with GPS um, and kind of general networks, you don't need to be on your trust network. So you can just take your phone into work and you can access this kind of stuff anyway, just through a roaming network. Um, which is what I'm hearing from a lot of people that follow me. But yeah, interesting point about studies, I'm not sure, to be honest. I'm just going to have one, having said the last question, that this truly really is the last question. Nancy, thank you. Hello, my name is Nancy Owens. I'm the content and social media editor for Cochrane.org, and I am actually Cochrane Collab tweeting on Twitter. Um, Andre, you and I have already had a conversation about this, but I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about the complexities of trying to engage at the organizational level, um, given the huge amount of information that we have accessible to us and um, the impossibility of being able to offer specialist information at every level um, without a huge amount of capacity and what kinds of things we can do to try to overcome that. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's definitely a shared task. It's not something that you can do alone. That goes without saying. Um, and I think what you've done on your own with the Twitter account as it currently is with uh, how many, 8,000 followers or something like that? 18,000. 18,000, wow, okay. In what period of time? In four years. Wow, yeah. that's brilliant. I mean, that, that's a testament to, uh, you know, the Cochrane organisation and that sort of Twitter activity, so that's fantastic. But I think, yeah, you're right, you know, what you want to do is you want to engage, when, when a new edition of the Cochrane Library gets published and you get a, a bunch of reviews coming out, you want to engage in discussions about those reviews. And so each month you've probably got, I don't know, 50, 60 things, mm -hmm. 56 interesting topics, half a dozen of them covered by press releases. And I imagine you get lots of questions coming in about that stuff. That is a, something that needs to be shared out across the organisation. There's lots of enthusiastic tweeters here. Uh, there's lots of people who hopefully will join Twitter as a result of, of this meeting uh, and get more engaged. But you definitely all need to think about who your social media person is within your review group. Um, and how you're going to engage with that kind of activity. And, you know, I guess work with Nancy to think about what the overall strategy for that could be. 
to, re related to that, if I could just say that I am offering social media tutorials and information in the foyer. So if anyone's interested, please come and see me. Thanks, Ashley. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm delighted to welcome our next speaker. And I think, Tracy, is this your first trip to a Cochrane event or meeting? No. no, no okay. No, no. So Tracy is Director of Sense About Science, which is a charity that equips uh, people to make sense of evidence. She's been a director of that since 2002. She's written extensively about evidence policy for a number of uh, newspapers and other publications. And we're delighted to have you come and speak to us. Looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you. Martin, thank you. Right. So it should be the case that I just follow on very naturally here. Okay. So, <coughs> yes, little lovely. Okay. Uh, so Andre's um, started from, from where you are and how looking at steps that you can take to move outward um, into, the, into engaging with more of the world. Well, I'm going to start from the other end, which is looking at many of those wider discussions and to show you through some of our own experiences at Sense About Science and others we work with that that world is far more susceptible to inf in influence and intervention than you might think it is uh, looking on. Um, just a, a quick summary of, where, of what we do. I think many of you know it and have interacted with us on individual <laughs> subjects. Um, Science About Science is a UK-based charity, but we have big collaborations um, all over the world. And what we do is we work with uh, around six to 7,000 um, signed-up scientists and hundreds of science organisations and everybody pretty much involved in the information supply chain uh, all the way through to midwives, uh, GPs, um, magazine writers, journalists, and so on. Um, and we work also with hundreds of social groups like Mumsnet and the Citizens Advice Bureau and Witch Magazine, and anybody really who applies evidence to any part of their lives or communicates it on. Uh, what we do is we chase down bad evidence and bad science. We promote uh, good science, sound science, and evidence in all areas of public life, and that includes policy making. Uh, and we also campaign to defend and protect people who get involved in that where it gets difficult. And many of you will be aware of work we've done on libel reform, for example, to protect uh, medical whistleblowers. Uh, you may be aware also, I hope you're aware, all of you, of the All Trials campaign, which is to uh, uh, promote the registration and uh, reporting of clinical trials and to really change that culture and the way the secrecy culture around uh, reporting of trials. So, uh, and if you haven't signed up to that, I urge you to do it. And I'm sure Ben Goldacre will have something to say about it later today. Uh, so that's kind of what we do. And this is the sort of world that we work in. We don't just work in uh, medical areas, but that obviously accounts for an awful lot of people's interest in matters of evidence and science. Um, <coughs> We, we are very much at the sharp end of things, so what we do is we respond when things are going wrong uh, or when the issue is posed in a way that really distances people from the evidence. Uh, that means that we respond to questions on any given day. Uh, a lot of our work is responsive. We don't know what's coming through the door. It could be something about nuclear power. It could be, do magnetic knickers prevent the menopause? Um, <laughs> I can tell you nuclear power is easier uh, to answer. Uh, we, do, we have uh, a For the Record section on our website where uh, in, that's the kind of first line, which is uh, where people who've been involved in research, uh, if either it's their field or they're actually the authors of a study that's been misrepresented, um, can get in touch and, and put something up there. And, and journalists now consult that very regularly. But increasingly, uh, that only really works because of the um, social media that goes on around it uh, in terms of pushing that out to people and changing the message. But we do a lot of responsive work. Sometimes that responsive work is very much behind the scenes. It's getting on to journalists and telling them that they've got something wrong in the way that Andre describes, very effective. It's also really good to get on to journalists and tell them when they've got something right. It's also really good to get on to journalists when their paper is the only one in which a really stupid story didn't appear and congratulate them for the fight they must have had with their editor to keep it out. I mean, that really needs to happen far more often. You can guarantee if a story hasn't run in a paper and everyone else is telling people, pregnant women that household chemicals are causing birth defects uh, and, and on, on the scantest of evidence from a, from a mouse study, um, you, know, you can guarantee that there was an almighty fight in the editorial room if it's not in that paper, because that's a, that's a real, you know, it's a news value story. 
Um, so we do an awful lot of that kind of thing. We also get on to people who stand up in Parliament and say silly things, to ministers who make stupid statements, and so on. But we also spend a lot of time reposing the kinds of issues um, that people... So where we feel we're firefighting, you know, the same issues are coming up time and time again. Uh, when, what we do is we draw out the underlying misconceptions. We work on... Yeah, why is it? What, you know, for, for example, on chemical stories, the idea, for example, that everything natural must be safe, everything synthetic must be harmful. You know, that underlines nearly every story that runs, a scare story that runs in the papers, and nearly every kind of beauty and lifestyle uh, thing about how you can have a natural alternative for your family. You know, using henna for your hair, for example, which is, of course, actually far more allergenic than any of the synthetic uh, hair dyes and things like this. So uh, a good example of that was testing. We had a lot of people sending us examples where um, people were buying over the counter tests, but also sending, you know, big advert in the Sunday Times, give your loved one peace of mind this Christmas, buy them an all body um, a CT scan. <laughs> now, if you've ever done any research on CT scans, you know that the last thing you're going to get from that is peace of mind. You're definitely not going to be normal. Um, so we, we got together with uh, lots of people involved in clinical biochemistry and medical uh, physics and all sorts of other areas and produced Making Sense of Testing, uh, which, as you can see, began to repose the issue so that the thing that is lasting to people is there's a question to be asked here about the evidence when I look at this question. You know, there is a science question to be asked on this. Uh, we did a similar thing with radiation, uh, where, you know, again, it's something where... Um, lots and lots of different subjects from using Wi-Fi to um, whether you should protect your baby's crib from being in the room with a computer, all sorts of other things. Um, it's, this is an interesting one I'll raise with you, is that is drawing out those assumptions. Sometimes people involved in the research have no idea what it is about their insights that makes them look at a story that's out there in society, whether it's something people have put onto their Facebook page or whether it's in the national papers. They don't know why it is that they dismiss it or they think, well, I don't really rely on that. Um, and someone else believes it when they read it or some journalist thinks it's worth publishing. So what we try to draw out is what are your working assumptions when you read this as somebody with a bit of specialist inside knowledge or some awareness of evidence standards um, and what, is, uh, what are theirs. And this is a great example of it because there's radiation within five minutes of getting everybody into the meeting uh, to talk about the state of the discussion out there. Uh, it's really clear that they're looking at the world, the radiation is a spectrum. And it, some, some of this radiation damages cells and some of it doesn't. And as soon as you start that being a working assumption, you start to cut into a lot of these public debates. There was a really useful tool that we drew out. And the way we drew it out was by looking at what actually is the discussion out there, not saying let's start by telling people all about radiation or all about the latest research into mobile phone technologies and radiation. What we did is we said, let's start by looking at what the discussion actually is. What questions are people putting on forums? What are they tweeting at each other? What are campaign groups saying? Um, and that kind of thing. And then we reviewed it. In fact, when we, we do these, we, we call the first meeting the nonsense meeting, because when you get a bunch of experts in the room and you review something like that, the first thing they tell you is how much nonsense there is. And that's when you say, OK, it seems like nonsense to you, but why does it seem logical to the people who are producing it? And let's get under that. Um, so that's what we did with radiation. Um, and we do it with pretty much everything that we do. We start by doing a kind of audit on, on, on what the discussion is. A, quite a difficult thing to do when it came to screening, as you can probably appreciate. Uh, but again, uh, Making Sense of Screening did a similar thing uh, at trying to rebalance some of the perceptions uh, around the screening. And this was in the wake of the Jade Goody cervical cancer issue that was blow by blow, day by day, in the newspapers and where everybody was calling, for, you know, we had Gordon Brown was Prime Minister at the time and made a statement, much to the surprise of his uh, civil servants, that they were going to introduce screening, cervical screening uh, from girls from um, 16. Uh, and a few people in the medical world thought, been there, done that, it didn't come out too well. Um, so making sense of screening, uh, a similar kind of thing. And <coughs> we also did a similar thing in statistics. Uh, and so I'm not saying you don't have to just pick issues that people think they're already interested in. I mean, most people in the population do not think they're interested in statistics. Uh, but actually, when you start getting across to people, if a statistic is the answer, what was the question? You know, that becomes a great way to read the newspapers and a great way to look at information you're getting on websites or in areas you're interested in. Uh, so, so that did rather well, too. Um, then... Uh, 
hang on, where have I, I've just uh, let myself, okay, I'm just going to, uh, right, that's the, that is the selection of things, there's a whole load more coming, uncertainties on the way. Then I wanted to show you this, which is uh, to really underline this point about starting where the discussion is when you go out there with a publication, even if it is a fairly heavy science publication, start with where the discussion is, at least in thinking about how you position it, not necessarily that you're going to get to write it in a, in a very different way from the way that you do, although I think Andre and others have identified there's a lot of scope there for Cochrane, uh, but also thinking about how you position it. What questions are you connecting up with? What problems are people having um, that are already going on? This was something we did, so I've, nothing, I've got nothing to lose by trying it. I think it was by far and away our most successful publication. Uh, because of the campaign around it. And it was a collaboration with uh, a lot of um, uh, disease uh, organisations, neuroscience organisations, um, particularly looking at the problems of alternatives uh, like you know, unlicensed stem cell therapies, for example, for multiple cirrhosis uh, patients. People who have chronic conditions for which there is no easy cure, there's no, well, there's no cure, um, and who are, of course, Googling that stuff and finding all sorts of things. Um, so I'm going all over the place. Here we go. You love that. You can see it again. Um, right. Um, all sorts of things uh, being promoted to them. And what was happening was that the Multiple Cirrhosis Society and the Alzheimer's uh, organisations and the Parkinson's Disease Association had all noticed, motor neurons, they had all noticed that on their patient forums, people were posting things like, um, my husband um, has had multiple cirrhosis, has been wheelchair bound, but yesterday walked for the first time. He used the lightning process, here is the link. So they were posting as patients and as carers um, about these things. They were starting to come up with kind of regularity and worded in a very similar way. And of course, it realised that the other people who are taking advantage of all these means of communication uh, and all these interactivity uh, were people marketing their products in this way. Um, and it was a ra rather cruel and unpleasant thing to be doing. Um, so we began to get involved in this. The reason why it's important, I think, and why, why this publication not only led to a very, very wide discussion across the media and all sorts of specialist publications, and there you see, um, I think, first of all, it was because we started with what was the experience of people going online. They were thinking, I've got nothing to lose by trying it. But then they have stories also coming back from patients who had had an awful lot to lose by trying it. The post bag we got when we published this uh, moved me to tears because we had people writing to us telling us about how they'd remortgaged their houses for example, in order to drive their wife all around the country trying these things out to take her to Brazil for goat's blood serum injections and she had died and then he realised I should have just taken her on holiday. And it was the most tragic, tragic post bag that we got from this. People, chat wrote for, with Alzheimer's saying he's newly diagnosed and he was so grateful to have this publication because well-meaning people kept pulling things off the internet and out of the newspapers and giving them to him. Try this diet. His wife was getting really angry with him because he wouldn't do his brain training exercise regime and things like this. And he had no f way, he felt, to be able to hold it at bay and say, whoa, you know. And, and you know, he wrote, I already feel like I'm not the husband I, I, I was once and, and I'm, you know, feeling even worse now. So, you know, in terms of the extra thought that comes from working out where people are starting when they're looking for your information or your information in some further form, but just starting with what is actually the discussion out there? What's the pull? Never mind my push, what's the pull? Um, and as I say, not only did, um, did we do that, but we, um, we had a lot of uh, response to it as well. Okay. <coughs> um, now, we also... Don't, you don't always have to uh, just look within a very traditional realm of discussion. Um, sometimes I think we, because we focus very much on the healthcare delivery system,